It's a great honor and as well as challenge to talk to such a distinguished audience today. And everybody per perhaps uh, expects that the former president of a country is going to talk about politics, or at least about topics very closely related to the policy making. I'm sorry, I will not talk about the politics. I will talk about how the death can have a positive impact on our lives. I have not been a politician all my life. I have played basketball. I have played in a rock band. I have served in the Soviet Army. My life was full of various temptations, challenges, and experiences. But the most of my life, 30 long years, I have spent in an operating room doing surgery as an orthopedic surgeon. And being a physician is the essence of my life. Ladies and gentlemen, there are only two moments in our lives we will never be able to remember. The first one is our birth, and the other one is our death. Of course, you all celebrate the birthday parties every year, thanking your parents for this brilliant possibility to be alive and enjoy the life. And of course, your dads and moms remember every detail of this definite date when you were born. But you don't remember anything, because you can't. The death is a mystery. Very often a topic which looked upon as taboo. Many of you are afraid of it. Because nobody of us knows the exact date and the time of our death. And we don't know anything how it is going to happen. But to fully appreciate the value of our lives and to fully understand the meaning of our lives, I would suggest people in their early 20s to experience two things, at least one childbirth, and at least one death. I'm not talking about the funeral. I'm talking about the moment when the person is passing away. The first time I met a dead body was when I started my medical studies at the age of 18. During an anatomy course, we had to dissect cadaver. Scary but very exciting story. I enjoyed understanding the structure of human body and learning the com very complicated names of uh, muscles and nerves. But there was nothing personal. The cadaver was just a, a teaching tool for me. I took this as a reality. I didn't think about that this cadaver once had been a living person with his own joy and sorrow, with his own successes and failures. It was just a teaching tool. A year later, I saw a person passing away. I was working in a hospital. And even I had a duty to transport the dead body to a specific cadaver storage facility. There was nothing personal to me. It uh, looked like something what I have seen in movies, or nowadays people, you know, experience playing the computer games. There was no evidence of presence of death at that moment. But the things change suddenly a few years later, when I was 24. There was an episode in my life which suddenly changed entirely, totally, 
and significantly my attitude towards death. My patient died in my hands, and it happened in a few minutes because of allergic reaction. I even didn't understand what's going on. But the patient very clearly whispered to me, I'm dying. And he died. That was a shock to me. I was supposed to treat this person. I was supposed to get him back to a healthy life. But instead of that, he passed away. And I couldn't do anything to help him. That was devastating. But what we learned from this episode, I learned that human life is a very fragile, a thing which needs to be protected all the time. And death became a very personal issue to me. The next experience with deadly situations was Chernobyl. On April 26, 1986, a deathly devastating explosion in a nuclear power plant in Ukraine created the most disastrous nuclear catastrophe in the history of mankind. And only two weeks later, I, as a reserve officer of the Soviet army, was sent to this contaminated area for a rescue operation. There was no concrete plan how to stop the deadly radioactive contamination. The Soviet army was prepared for nuclear war but the Soviet army was not prepared for an accident in a peaceful nuclear power plant. Rude jokes replaced argument-based commands. And there was an invisible danger to our health and to our lives all around. Because radioactivity is a danger as a threat, has no warning signs. You cannot feel it, you cannot see it, you cannot hear it. You even cannot uh, smell it. You can really recognize that by your knowledge, looking at the display screens of radioactivity measurement devices. But these devices were available only to medical officers too few for the scale of the catastrophe. And we medical officers had to convince the others that there is a danger around, threatening their health, threatening their life expectancy. But people could not resist eating the ripe strawberries and cucumbers from the fields of abandoned villages. These tempting berries and vegetables had at least two times higher radioactivity level than the area surrounding it. But the people couldn't resist because that was an invisible danger. When I came back home, after Chernobyl, I decontaminated me myself as fiercely as I could. In the nearest shop, I bought all new clothes. In the nearest barber shop, I shaved my hair. I called my family and said, I'm going to sauna to clean up my body as thoroughly as I can, because I don't want to bring as a souvenir to my family a radioactive particle. So what I learned uh, from Chernobyl, the first is that the danger and the threat could be invisible. 
And this is not relevant only about the radioactivity. They are, at the first glance, very innocent actions we are doing very often. Careless driving, smoking, diving in unknown waters, and the list is much, much longer. And we didn't know that we approach the threat of death. And the second thing I learned that people have to protect each other. Those with the knowledge, or let's say with a guess about what's going on, how to prevent the others from the strings and arrows of outrageous fortune attacking them. When I became a president of the country, I had to sign a parliament vote for sending our troops to Afghanistan. A very substantial decision, a very substantial responsibility. When I visited my troops in, in Afghanistan, I asked the soldiers, how can I, as a president of a country, can protect your lives? And I expected uh, that they would answer, better guns, better boots, or maybe something else. But they just said, build the schools and drill the wells. That will make the relationship with the local people better, and that will protect our lives. Very simple. And a few months later, I participated in a funeral of a soldier killed in the battle. I kneeled down in front of, of his parents and said, I'm sorry for your son. We will all miss him. He's a hero. And there were tears in my eyes because I couldn't protect him, because this is not always possible. And when I have learned about death, invisible threat, when I have learned that we have to protect our lives, when I have learned that there, we have the responsibility for the, ourselves and the others, to prevent the danger. And when I have learned that personal approach to death is of great importance, death became even much more personal to me. I've got a cancer. Wow, what a shattering news. Yes. I have been performing tumor surgery in my surgical practice. I had the experience to talk to cancer patients and their relatives. I could easily, you know, accept the radical treatment plan without any hesitation. That's true. But there still was a question. Why me? What was wrong with me? What I have done wrongly in my life? These questions became a priority to me. And I tried my best, but I got the answers in about two or three months. Just one day. I remembered another day. When I came back home from my job, very tired, very exhausted, I sat down on a sofa and said to myself, I have had a very successful professional career. I have had a very successful political career. I have done a lot of good things in my life. My children are grown up. I'm satisfied with my life. And it's so easy to give up and just die. And that was the mistake. That was a terrible mistake. Because if you say you have done everything in your life, there's no any sense to live anymore. And the God blesses you and prepares you for passing away. I immediately corrected this mistake. I decided never to say it again. I decided never to think it again. I decided to live long life, to enjoy the life, to work, to create new ideas, projects, and keep on going in my life. As a doctor, I like prescriptions. That's a part of my job. 
to prescribe something to my patients and to myself too. And there are only three prescriptions which will make your life successful and which will make you to accept the invisible presence and understand the invisible presence of death all through your lives since your birth. The first prescription is never say you have done everything in your life. Keep on working, keep on creating, keep on making your life better, keeping, keep on making our life or our world better. The second is never say you have learned everything and you know everything. Keep on learning, studying, exploring the world around you. And the third one, never say you have lost the sense of life. Because the sense of life is just living. That's so simple. My friends, the dead body has only two fundamental rights. To disappear and to be remembered. We are all alive. We have to go on working, growing, feeling, enjoying the life, and then we will be remembered. Don't let the fear of death paralyze you. Don't be afraid of that, because this is just a reminder of the great potential we all have while we are alive. It's rather an everyday motivation to feel, to enjoy every moment of the life. And that's what I wish you. Here I stand, trying to inspire you. I hope I did well. Thank you.